Today we have Steve Wiebe on the channel. He is the subject of the 2007 film King of Kong. He is a two-time world champion in Donkey Kong. And thanks for being on the channel, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tony. Awesome. So uh, this interview, we're going to talk about King of Kong, Billy Mitchell, and your future plans uh, for Donkey Kong, if you will. So first off, uh, what are you doing to survive the pandemic and to stay sane? Uh, that's a good question. I'm um, just hanging out in the house. We're going out a little bit. We can we can go to restaurants now in Seattle. Um, but I don't go out to like parties and beaches and things. And so I'm hanging inside watching movies, playing Donkey Kong now, of course, and just doing some chores, work stuff around the house. Has it affected your teaching career at all? Are you still teaching? Yeah, I'm still teaching. We had to do online teaching. Starting in March, we closed the schools and we had to do online teaching. And some of the students couldn't get online, of course. We had to kind of be lenient with the way we graded. So it became like a, a pass-fail kind of grading for the kids. So, But next year, we're hoping to get into the schools and and be in person teaching, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen in a couple months. I hear you. I'm a fellow educator myself and I, I had to do the exact same thing. So, all right. So I'm going to ask you some questions about King of Kong in particular, and just that legacy with that film. And uh, just some, some thoughts that I've had as a fan. Uh, I watched it back in 2007. I was still in college. And it impacted me greatly. So first off, how did the filmmakers of King of Kong, how did they find you? How did they discover you to be a part of the movie? Yeah. Um, well, everyone thinks I was great friends with, with these people, that, the movie makers, but I was, I didn't know who they were. I knew of Ed Cunningham, who played football at the University of Washington. And I was, we're about the same age. And I was going to the University of Washington when he was playing football. And my friend, Mike Thompson, who actually appears in The King of Kong, um, was I was telling him all these things that was happening with my Donkey Kong world record pursuit. And when it came to the time, I told him about Brian Q and Perry Rogers coming over to my house um, and examining my machine. He thought it was becoming like a big story that could be told. He's a screenwriter for in a, in, for Hollywood or, or does Hollywood movies and things. So he kind of knows a good story when he hears one. So he relayed this information to Seth Gordon and Ed Cunningham, who were doing documentaries at the time. And the one they were finishing up was called New York Dolls. It's about that punk rock band. And um, they were just wrapping that one up and they're looking for new material. So when they heard this story, they were interested in it. And I met um ed cunningham one night and he just said hey take a you know go and write down all the stuff that has happened before now because they weren't they weren't there for a lot of the stuff that had happened previously but they started following it right when the fun spot came on is basically where the film crew um joined it, joined the story okay um so I've heard many claims that King of Kong has been uh, kind of like a docudrama, if you will. Uh, can you speak about that? And if there is any basis behind that claim, uh, in particular, I've heard some claims that there were some staged elements of the movie. Is that true? Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, I don't know anything staged. They... Um came over to my, the first time they came over was when you see my, it's my son's birthday, 2005. And they were just watching us around the house and asking questions. And they came to my school one, uh, a little bit after that and interviewed me at one of the schools, but I don't think any of that footage got into the movie. Um, a lot of people will say that my daughter was, prodded to say that one line where a lot of people ruin their lives um chasing guinness world records and that's not true she said that on her own um i think what people 
um, to tend to have a gr- uh, gripe about is they some of the stuff they can't show everything in the movie, and there's stuff that was omitted and maybe omitted to 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 tell the story because they were, they were actually yeah, trying to tell a story. It wasn't just like if you watch the History Channel, a bunch of talking heads just saying facts and that wouldn't entertain anybody. So they knew that they were going to try to tell a story, but they showed events and omitted things that maybe would change what the story was saying. But the truth of the events is there. Whatever you see on camera is truthful. I went to fun spot, you know, I, I did that score. Then I went to the Guinness tournament in Florida and, and all those things happen. And, and some things, because of the time constraints, they can't put everything in the movie. There's things that I wish they could have told more about. But And I know Billy's probably wishing they could have told more about his side of the thing. Um, but at the end of the day, we just have to accept it's entertainment. And, you know, is the when you watch Bachelor or Bachelorette, are you thinking that everything that there is not script? There's probably some producer orchestrating a little bit although they'll probably tell you that's not happening but there's got to be some some interference by the producers to tell the make it good good tv so you know there's always that when when it's you know it's not a documentary in the in the terms of just someone stating all these facts and there's no story so so when billy mitchell he goes uh when you're down in florida for example and you're still playing and Billy's kind of strolling around that arcade. So that was factual. That was, that's something that actually happened. Did he, do you think he did that to intimidate you? I don't know. Yeah. He did come in there and he made a circle around and then he left. He didn't play. I don't know what he wasn't. I don't know what prompted him to come at the end. He wasn't planning on playing, but, um, he came and then I didn't, I didn't talk to him. We just left. Okay, cool. Uh, next question. Roy Sh- uh, Schiltz. Um, <laughs> he was yeah, a large. Roy. Yeah. Good old Roy. Uh, Mr. Awesome himself. He was a large part of the narrative in the King of Kong. Do you still have a relationship with him? And do you think that the filmmakers, like you were saying earlier, they, they had to tell a story. Do you think that was part of that narrative or uh, just go and talk about Roy. Yeah. Roy is interesting. Yeah. He, I had no idea who Roy was. I submitted a Donkey Kong world record. That was the score of 947,000, maybe some change there. I don't know if it, what exactly the score was, but it was 947,000 about, and, then I got an email from Roy Schilt, like maybe a month or so later, saying, hey, do you know what they're planning to do with your record? Um, did you play it on a double Donkey Kong? And that, this stuff, stuff didn't get in the story of, of the King of Kong because it was, I think it was an original version they had, but it was so much in depth that pe- it lost people. They don't, what's a double Donkey Kong? So they, they had to take this part out. But um, I go, no, I didn't. I go, yeah, I played on Double Donkey Kong. I wasn't trying to fool anybody. It was, I was told it was a uh, legitimate board by the the person that designed it. And he said, there's no altering of the code. It's all outside of the game. The switches between Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. And I emailed the guy telling him I'm going for world records. And he said, yeah, it should be good. So I didn't have any issues with playing on it. I didn't think it was a problem. But then when they listen to the sounds of Mario, you can hear the sounds of Donkey Kong Jr., the, the, the way Mario moves and jumps. So it's clearly not the same sounds as Donkey Kong. So when I heard from Roy, he, I was like, I didn't know that. And, and that eventually I, I heard more about them change. Uh, gonna, they're going to recategorize my score to a double Donkey Kong world record. And, and then at that point, I go, okay, I'll just get a regular Donkey Kong board. And then Roy, actually, I, I ordered one on my own on eBay, and, and the thing arrived and didn't work. And that, that I was trying to get my money back, and the person just didn't even respond after a while. And then Roy said, hey, I'll order you one. And Mike's Arcade, if you remember in the movie, it came in a box that had Roy Schultz 
return address on there, but it didn't come from Roy. It came from Mike. And you can probably call Mike. He's still around if you want to talk to him about it. He delivered it directly to me. And if it didn't get to me, then it would have went to Roy because, because where else would it have gone? Because Roy ordered it for me. But, it, and then I played on that. And I got scores of like 985, 999,500. And I finally got a million six thousand. And then that's where there was, they were going to certify the score. And then I, I mentioned that I, I, I was the first to get the million because at that time, Billy had submitted a tape a little bit after mine. He was kind of sitting on a tape. Maybe he was trying to get a higher score. But Robert Mersek wrote an article and I said, yeah, I'm not going to go along with the simultaneous million. I, that was kind of the goal to get the million first. And once I said that, I didn't hear anything for two weeks. And then that's when Brian Q was came over to my house one, one day and I was returning from work and I saw them in the garage. They didn't break in. I, I know people are mad if they think they like got a crowbar and like broke through the garage door. No, that's not what happened at all. They were there though. And I didn't know they were going to be there. And my mom, my mother-in-law let, let them in. They were just asking if they could come in. And then she actually paid, give them a, I think she gave them a quarter to play the game because the coin door was all locked up. <laughs> so at that point, that's when they saw the, the box that had Roy Schultz name on it. And then they were looking at the board and they came up with the gummy substance thing. And they, then at that point, that's where the, the story got taken over by the film crew. That's when I introduced the film crew to the story. And then from there, that's they were on board while, uh, filming pretty much the rest of this, the events that happened. But Roy was definitely someone he was, his involvement, he didn't do anything to any board or anything, but since he, he and Billy had some past him and Walter and, and Billy had some past disagreement about a missile command score. Roy was was upset with Billy, and I don't know the whole details, but um, maybe he threatened his life or whatever that was also said in the movie. So there was bad blood there, and then since I was associated now with Roy, they were thinking something was up when there was no there was no devious um, activity going on. Do you have a relationship with him now? Have you talked to him recently or anything? I haven't talked to him recently. I saw him at a, a gaming convention couple, maybe a couple of years ago. He might have went to a Kong off, actually, and he was his health is kind of bad. His, his knees are bad. He has a walker, so he's not doing so good physically. But I'd say hi to him there, but he doesn't call or anything. I don't talk to him outside of or to see him at one of those events. So how has the King of Kong, has it changed your life? Is it something you're proud of? Do you wish you can change anything from that experience? I think it was a neat experience going through it and meeting the people and some of the stuff that happened after it. Um, but some of the, the people that have very hard feelings about it, kind of, it's it's not very pleasant to to hear from those people where they they're hating on a lot of the people in the movie for various reasons. They feel there was the story is fictitious. Like there were, you know, and they were wronged in the movie and some of that may be right. Or, or I don't know what extent, but um, these people have been dead as against some of us, like Billy and I and a few others. Um, so that's kind of a negative about that, but I can handle that. There's, I'm not worried. There's nothing I'm hiding. I didn't cheat. No matter what someone is going to say here, I think he's planning a documentary here, another one in, in the near future. Um, but whatever he says, I, I have full explanations for. I know there's some stuff that happened with the double Donkey Kong. There was an eight-way joystick that I was using, which I didn't know it was one. And so they're going to pin that on that can look like that I'm trying to be deceitful. But there's nothing else besides those two things that were just totally innocent. Um, so I'm not worried about any of those things. But for the most part, I've enjoyed the experiences, meeting people at the Kong Offs. A lot of good 
times and, and I've met some good people along the way. So there's always a little negative. Take the good with the bad. So if you were to be approached to do a King of Kong 2, would you do it? Um, I don't know if I'd be more of the focus. I think I would, I would probably say, okay, if, if I knew the people had good intention for the movie, you know, I don't know if Billy would sign up for that because <laughs> you probably wouldn't trust anybody, but, um, the, the latest story, yeah, there's a lot of material you could pretty much pick up with the aftermath of the King of Kong. You could probably do a documentary just on the lives of everybody involved. There's people who want to get recognition, who felt they didn't get recognition in that movie. Um, I think the new, the new players really um, have helped carry the story forward. They've brought the game along and increased the high scores. There's a few players that would probably be more of the focus of it and maybe some of the litigation with with Twin Galaxies and Billy might be some of that in there. Um, I've been kind of quiet for the last several years. I played at Kong Offs and things, so I'd, I probably wouldn't be too much of a focus, but um, I'd be up for it if I knew there was good people doing it. Awesome. So we're going to shift gears here a little bit and kind of talk about some current events, if you're up for it. Talking sure. about Billy Mitchell in particular, Twin Galaxies, and Guinness uh, World Records. First off, let's go back to April of 2018. You were probably ready for this question. Uh, thinking about this question, what was your first reaction when you heard about the lifetime ban and removal of Billy Mitchell's records from Twin Galaxies and Guinness World Records? Yeah, it was pretty shocking. I couldn't believe they actually had evidence that they followed through and analyzed. And so I was pretty like blown away about what transpired there for sure. I knew that Billy would have some kind of response, which he has. So I don't know what, I mean, it looks like the game wasn't arcade. A lot of people who analyzed it are saying that. Um, but now Guinness has reversed that and haven't, they haven't said exactly what they said. There's eyewitnesses that they've talked to and more anal analysis done to, re to reverse the decision. So he's, his scores have been approved, but it's so, I don't know what's going on. I mean, it's really hard to tell what the truth is out there. It's, there's people that just, I don't know. It's really hard to say exactly what's going on. All I can do is control how I play the game. I just play play the game and submit scores, and hopefully um, that things will rule in my favor, which the latest score I put, put together was approved, so I'm glad that went through. Awesome. Uh, so after you heard about this lifetime ban and all this shocking news, did you reach out to Billy at all uh, and – do you still have a relationship with him or any contact with him currently? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't reach out to Billy. I don't, I've never talked to him with personal matters or anything, or but I've talked to him at shows and conventions and we're friendly. We'll say a few words and shake hands and, and then go about our business. So I don't have any ill will. I, don't, I think he's in a good place with me nowadays. Um, so I didn't say anything. Nothing is, I've talked about with him as, as uh, dealt with, with his banning. But um, I remember being at the Kong off a couple of years ago before he was banned, there was the discussion was still going around and, um, but I didn't talk to him about it. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so when, when the bands went down, and Twin Galaxies, they officially announced you as the first 1 million point score in Donkey Kong. How did that feel to you? Uh, was there some vindication? Uh, just just tell me how you, your feelings and your reaction to that. Yeah, my screen went to sleep for some reason. Hold on one second. There I am. I couldn't see it from it. Yeah, so when I was first 
uh, awarded the first to a million. Yeah, it was a great feeling because that was all along the, the goal to get that million. There was a lot of people didn't think it was possible. And I discovered that, you know, a technique to get the million. So I was, I was definitely knew it was possible. So when I first got it, I, I thought that was a big achievement. So I was hoping to get recognition and I did not at the time, but then getting it, whatever number of years later, uh, 13, I think it was, um, it felt good. Yeah. I felt like, okay, I, I can live with not being the greatest in Donkey Kong at this time. But at one point in time, I, I was, one, I was the best, had the world record and I had the first to a million. So I, I was, that was a good feeling to have that, um, recognition. Awesome. So with the more recent news with the Guinness world records being reinstated, reinstated with Billy's old scores and the claim that he's the first player to reach the Donkey Kong kill screen. Uh, does this surprise you? Uh, and do you think that this was planned to help with this case coming up? Yeah, I don't have any idea what happened with him and Guinness. Um, so nothing surprises me in this world anymore. I don't know. He's got, there's a case coming up against Twin Galaxies in the next week. So who knows what's going to happen if, if you'll win that one or not. Who knows? But I wish it was on TV. That'd be something to watch. <laughs> Yeah, uh, most definitely. I'm going to be following it. I've been following this uh, for two years now. And of course, I've been following your career for years. Uh, do you think Billy has a chance with a defamation case? And you can plead the fifth year, too, if you want to. <laughs> um, I don't I don't know, because I thought I heard that, that defamation is hard to prove because People can have a, there's like a fine line between having freedom of speech and then defamation. If you say something bad about somebody, but it's true, or there's elements of truth that I don't know what the law says. I don't think you can claim defamation if, if there's no intent to deliberately lie about somebody to bring them down. So I don't know if he can win that case, but I, I was looking through a few of the papers that that Twin Galaxies made available on their site. There was a, to members maybe only, but um, the documents are lengthy. You can read through all that stuff. There's a lot of little anecdotes about things that happen. And I don't know what, how the judge is going to view this at all, but I, I've heard in the, in, from some people that it's really hard to, unless it's black and white, someone's just making up a total lie to, to bring somebody else down for their benefit, then that would be a, a good chance that Billy would win. But it doesn't, from what I can see, it's going to be a difficult thing to prove defamation of character, but who knows? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to follow for sure. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about Billy with King of Kong, recent news, and then the 2018 banning? Anything you want to say here, add? Um, I guess I just want the truth to be to be told. Some at some point, I'd like to know. Everyone else would like to know exactly what's happening behind the scenes. I don't. It's really just a, a whirlwind of, of of news that's just circulating, and it'd be nice to just get to the bottom of what's happened over the last fifteen years through all the King of Kong and and even the recent stuff. So it, it'd be nice to hear. If, if it's, I don't know if we'll ever get the truth, but someone knows the truth and hopefully we'll get that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, a documentary over the King of Kong and then this whole time span, that would be interesting to say the least. Uh, so uh, the last bit of this interview, I, I want to focus on uh, some future plans that you have and some, some things that you've been doing recently on Twitch. Uh, in particular so you started a twitch account and you've been live streaming your daily or you've been not every day but on a regular basis you've been live streaming donkey kong games and you actually reached uh your personal best score here recently and you just you talked about that earlier in the interview so what made you decide to want to start playing again um 
yeah, I was always, I was talking to Robbie Lakeman even a few years ago and he was kind of encouraging me to get back into it and said, yeah, you should at least get 1.1 million. And Robbie is a current world record holder right now. And he's kind of exchanging that first place with a few other gamers, but right now he's number one and he was encouraging me. And I was at that time, didn't feel like putting in the work. I remember all, all the work that goes behind those scores. And I was, it wasn't important to me at that time. I, I was fine with where I was. And as time passed, there was a lot of players that started leapfrogging my score that I set back in 2010 and didn't bother me. But eventually I, I thought, Hey, I should just get something that represents my, my skill level. Cause I knew I could, I could break 1.1 1. 1 just, you know, with just a little bit of play. And, and that's why I went after it. I think just cause I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it, which I thought I could do. And then I also got an email from Jace, Hall at Twin Galaxies just kind of this was serendipitous with him bringing up something about some past score that I achieved and he was like just encouraging me to hey you should get back into this and it'd be something that the Donkey Kong community would would like to be like to hear and it'd be excited about it and I go yeah that's and I'd already thought about doing it but I wasn't going to make it a public thing I was just going to kind of do it privately and but once I, I heard him encouraging me, I went public and said and uh, posted something on a uh, note on Twin Galaxies saying I'm going to be entering the competitive gaming uh, community again. And then from there, I was I got the Twitch account. Somebody that had contacted me even months before had asked me about streaming and and I, I visited him at his work and he was saying, I'll set you up. I think a lot of people would, would like to watch you play Donkey Kong. And I was like, really? I, I don't even hold the record anymore. And But he's going, yeah, they would like to see you play still. And I go, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And, but then the coronavirus hit and we didn't have a chance to get it set up earlier. But then once we were able to kind of enter into phase one, where we are able to see people with this social distancing a little bit, uh, he came over and he set me up and He's got a really good setup going. I think it's really cool. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to regularly play it. Maybe not every day. I'm still practicing as well because I'm fine tuning some of the techniques I'm, I've been developing. So, but I'll be on there either every other day, maybe, you know, at least a few times a week. So it's pretty cool to be uh, streaming. Awesome. So you kind of answered my question. Uh, but what's your goal with the Twitch account? Do you want to try to go for another world record? Um, and what's it going to take if you actually want that goal? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of taking baby steps. I I got the 1.1 million. The next goal would be 1.15, which if I play the way I, I'm capable of playing, I, I can do that score. But from there, to get to 1.2 million, I'm going to have to do some more reinventing of my gameplay, just a few other tweaks, which would require me to like really dive in and practice even more. And if, once I started doing that, if I felt like I was making enough strides and where I could compete against John McCurdy and Robbie Lakeman and Wes Copeland, some of the, the top three guys, um, then I would maybe pursue it. But that's a lot of time that you have to devote where you're, if you're trying to break the world record nowadays, you have to really get a good start on the game and push the limits the entire game and surviving that for those three and a half hours playing at the point pressing that they play at is a lot of dedication. You have to really die a lot and restart. So I don't know yet. yet. We'll see once I break the 1.15 million, um, then I'll see if I have the, if I have the skills and the desire to keep going. So that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, what's your family think of this? Um, are they like, here we go again, or are they excited for you? Uh, it's kind of, yeah, it's a little mi mixed messages maybe, but um, my wife's fine with it as long as I don't just abandon her and go to the garage all the time. So I have to keep a balance. 
my kids don't mind it. They're all, they're both home. Uh, my son goes to university of Washington. He's a, he's going to be a junior next year, but he's taking online classes and he, he's got his own thing. He's not, not really care one way or the other. Um, my daughter doesn't really care about, about it, but so as long as I keep my wife happy and keep a, a balance between the game and her and the family, she'll be okay with it. That's funny. Uh, so has there been any reaction in the retro competitive world? And have they noticed that you're competing and, and you're, you got your personal best? And has anyone reached out to you? I know you talked about Robbie and Jace a little bit, uh, but what's been the reaction to the Twitch channel? Yeah, people have been supportive. Um, I'm really happy that um, people are supporting me on this. Um, yeah, they've, they've reached out and said congratulations. And so I've had a lot of positive feedback. Um, so that's great. So it helps, you know, keeps me motivated and inspires me to keep playing. So that's all. I, this should be a, a fun thing where we support each other. And hopefully that continues. Excellent. All right, so I've done some interviews in the past, and I do, uh, to end the interview, I usually do like a little lightning round. Uh, it's a word association type game, and either like one word or a few words to describe these particular words or people. Um, and um, first word or first topic, kill screen. Um, first word, difficult. Just trying to get to the kill screen is is an accomplishment. So anyone that can do that, it, that's a great accomplishment. Have, have you? This is a side question. Sorry, just popped into my head. Have you ever gotten to the kill screen? And don't have I got to the kill screen? Yeah, that's you all usually get there when you get high score. So I've been there several times. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, second, well, it's it's a name, Walter Day. He's. I felt he supported me even when there was people that were trying to influence him not to support me. So I, I feel I'm in a good place with Walter. I, I, I like Walter. Third fun spot. Um, just getting the 985,000 live was a good feeling with everyone watching there. Um, that's probably what I'd say about fun spot. Four Robbie Lakeman. Hell of a Donkey Kong player. So if you ever get a chance to watch him group barrels, him and John McCurdy as well, and Wes Copeland too. Um, and Dean Segler, who plays MAME mostly, but he's he can play arcade. Um, they just can group barrels like it's – they've been doing it for so long. It's like almost like breathing to them. So just great player. And then the last one, this one might be a little controversial, Dwayne Richards. Yeah, Dwayne, uh, yeah, I don't, I didn't do anything to him exactly, but he's got a, a vendetta out for me. So I'm a little leery about Dwayne, but I don't, I don't have any ill will towards him, but, um, I just hope he can come to peace with the King of Kong, but I don't know. Just, I'll say it's a little leery, leery of, of what his ideas are going to bring. And then this is just a bonus one, uh, Tim McVeigh. Um, Nibbler. I just remember he's the or had the Nibbler record or some, something with Nibbler, but um, I haven't met him before. But um, Nibbler would be my word. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you, Steve. Um, I want to wish you good luck on your future Twitch endeavors and Donkey Kong. I'll be watching and following. And uh, thank you for this interview. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks. Bye.